Hi class, this is part two of the endocrine system. Part one was dedicated solely just to the mighty pituitary gland. So if you have not seen that video, you need to check that one out first. The master gland of the endocrine system must understand that gland, must understand the hormones that are coming from that gland. We are going to explore the rest of the endocrine system in this video. We are going to be starting with our next pure endocrine gland, the thyroid gland. Remember, pure endocrine glands, their sole function is only to make and release hormones. That's it. They have no other job. So we're going to be looking at the thyroid gland next. The thyroid gland, the largest pure endocrine gland in the body. It is it's bilobed, it has two lobes, and it has this butterfly shaped to it. Sits just inferior to the thyroid cartilage. That's why they're calling this is thyroid cartilage because it's right next to the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland produces two hormones. T4, we call thyroxine, and T3, triiodone thyroxine. Now these are protein hormones and they have iodine within them try iodine so, so we need we need iodine to form these amino acid hormones now what stimulates the thyroid gland who's who's telling the thyroid gland to secrete hormones its hormones the anterior pituitary gland, remember with TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone is going to, this is its target organ, is going to have the thyroid gland release T3 and T4. T3 is actually the active form of, of the hormone. T4 will be converted into T3 and T3 is the active form of the hormone. Thyroid hormones target many, many, many cells in the body. Their function is to regulate metabolism and basal metabolic rate. Basically, how much energy you burn up performing basic bodily functions. They are in charge of that metabolic rate. Now, if things go wrong, and the thyroid is one of those glands, if you're in medicine, you're going to see go wrong a lot. If you have hyperthyroidism, that just means too much thyroid hormone is released. Now, the symptoms of that are related to its function. It is stimulating metabolism. If your metabolism is way too high, you're going to experience weight loss. You're going to feel a little nervous, anxious. You're going to have a little tremor. You're always going to be feeling hot because your metabolic rate is so high. Your heart is going to be beating really fast and you can actually de develop an irregular heart rate. You're going to have problems sleeping. You just can't go to sleep. And some people will go on to develop exophthalmus. Exophthalmus You've probably seen it. It has to do with the eyes. These are bulging eyes. What happens with this, why they're bulging, is normally we have fat, fat uh, on the backside of our eyes um, that's protecting them, but that fat, that fatty tissue gets real big, so it pushes the eyeballs forward out of their socket a little bit. So this, this person had hyperthyroidism, and you can see <laughs> very prominent here, and here's back to normal. The most common cause of hyperthyroidism is a condition called Graves' disease. You will see that. You will hear about that. Graves' disease is an autoimmune disease. What is autoimmune disease? Basically means your immune system is attacking yourself. And basically what your immune system is doing, it is, it's 
making antibodies that are stimulating the TSH receptors. So these antibodies are kind of acting like a rogue TSH. So the TSH is stimulate, stimulating um, these receptors on the thyroid cells. And now the thyroid gland is just like fully activated, continuing um, to produce T4 and T3. So that needs to be treated. That is hyperthyroidism. And the opposite of hypo, hyperthyroidism would be hypothyroidism, a hyposecretion of thyroid hormones. So the, the, the symptoms are going to be basically the opposite. You're going to have a low metabolic rate. You're going to start gaining weight. You're always going to feel cold. Your metabolism is so slow. You're going to feel tired, constipated, mental sluggish. That brain fog just never clears up. And you can develop a goiter. And a goiter is just an enlargement of the thyroid gland. What happens with hypothyroidism, well, there's a number of reasons you can have hypothyroidism, but the main cause is something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And this is another autoimmune disorder. Now they're making antithyroid antibodies and they're actually destroying the thyroid cells. So they're, they're destroying parts of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland cannot make its T3 and T4. So hyposecretion of thyroid, hypothyroidism, that has to be treated also. You've got to treat all of these. Next on our list of pure endocrine glands is the parathyroid gland. Para means alongside the thyroid gland. So these parathyroid glands are tiny. They are on the back side of the thyroid gland. Here's the front side of the thyroid gland. And you see these four tiny little blobs here. These are the parathyroid glands. They are tiny, but they are distinct tissue. They are separate little glands from the thyroid gland. This is just where they are located. Their job is to produce a hormone called parathyroid hormone. That's nice. Parathyroid gland makes the parathyroid hormone PTH. PTH is released when serum calcium levels drop below a set threshold that your body needs. We need calcium for multiple, multiple processes in our body. If you take in physio, it's all about the calcium. Where is that calcium ion going? So we need it. So we need to keep our calcium levels at a right at the proper level. So if calcium is low, where where is the pyroth the PTH parathyroid hormone? Where are what are the target organs? Where do we store calcium number one? This you learned a long time ago in bone. Remember, we store calcium in bone. And it is the osteoclasts that the PTH are activating. Remember your osteoclasts? They are modified macrophages. They're phagocytes. They are going to break down the bone matrix and release calcium into the blood. So these osteoclasts are activated and they're going to release that stored calcium that's being stored in the bone matrix and into the blood. The next place for PTH is going to act on the kidneys. When we're making our filtrate, we can have calcium in that filtrate. PTH is going to make sure that all that calcium is reabsorbed 
from the nephrons and not peed out. We don't want to pee out any any calcium in that, that filtrate. We want to reabsorb it back into the blood. And the last place we're going to have calcium. Remember, we need vitamin D to absorb calcium from our dietary foods. Well, PTH is going to activate vitamin D to increase calcium absorption from the small intestines. So three places where we can capture some more calcium to keep our blood calcium level at a steady state. So remember, calcium is essential to life. Low calcium levels will lead to lethal, meaning deadly, neuromuscular disorders. So we must keep our calcium level in the proper range. Now we get to our next pure endocrine gland, the adrenal gland. You've seen this already, so you kind of know where it's at. It sits on top of, there's an adrenal gland on top of each kidney. And you know by now there's there's two parts to the kidney, to the, to, there's two parts to the adrenal gland. There's the adrenal cortex, which is the outer most layer and the adrenal medulla, the inner layer. So we say each adrenal gland has two endocrine glands in it. The internal medulla, remember this is where the autonomic sympathetic nervous system goes to in times of st real stress and emergency situation. The autonomic nervous system will go there. Um, the sympathetic nervous system and it will release norepinephrine and epinephrine into the blood. These are acting like hormones and then that norepinephrine um, and epinephrine goes throughout your whole body and that is going to trigger a rush of quote adrenaline. So anytime you hear that a rush of, of adrenaline, they're calling it adrenaline because it's coming from the adrenal gland. But basically, it's epinephrine and norepinephrine. So this you've already learned. The hard one to understand is going to be the adrenal cortex. Now, all the cortex hormones, the adrenal cortex hormones, are what we call steroid hormones. The main hormones from the adrenal cortex that we are concerned with are the cortico, cortico, steroids cortico because they're coming from the cortex and they're steroids you've probably heard about steroids sometime in your life the main steroid that we're going to be concentrating on is cortisol and when you take physio hopefully they're going to be talking about this this hormone cortisol um, real important in managing long-term stress. Short-term stress, like running away from a tiger that's trying to, to eat you, that's going to be the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. That's short-term. That's coming from the medulla. Long-term stress response is going to be coming from the adrenal cortex with the release of cortisol, are these cortical steroids. What is prolonged stress? Like anxiety, chronic anxiety, some kind of trauma that is like going over and over again, um, being in a crowded place all the time, having some kind of, of prolonged infection that your body is trying to deal with. These are all chronic stressors on our body. Remember, it is the hypothalamus that is going to trigger the release of ACTH from the anterior pituitary gland. ACTH is going to, this is its target organ, the adrenal cortex. ATH will trigger the release of corticosteroids. 
This is such an important gland. I'm going to be talking about it a little bit more just so you kind of remember it, especially if you're going into nursing. This is one of those glands you will, you will be seeing and hearing about and need to understand. So let's just look at it a little bit closer. So here we said the adrenal gland, we have our short, short term response to stresses. We have the hypothalamus sending out that signal to our autonomic nervous system. And then we're going to have that impulse from the lateral horn of the spinal cord. It's going to go straight to the adrenal medulla that's going to release epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood. And it does all the things that the sympathetic nervous system you would expect it to do. Increase your heart rate, increase blood pressure, liver is going to convert glycogen to glucose for energy, dilation of the bronchioles, the smooth muscles in your lungs, increase your metabolic rate. But this is all short, short term. If you have chronic stressors, chronic stress still going to be picked up by the hypothalamus. Remember the hypothalamus is in charge of the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus picks up that chronic stress that your body is feeling. It's going to re release CR a releasing hormone, corticotrophic releasing hormone is going to come down from the hypothalamus. It's a hormone. It's going to travel to the blood to get to the anterior pituitary gland that will then release ACTH that will travel to the in the blood to the adrenal cortex. You're going to have these long-term stress re, um, responses. Don't really need to know them all. Um, you look at them, retention of sodium and water by the kidneys, that's going to tend um, to increase your blood pressure, your blood volume. Proteins and fats are converted to glucose. Mm, they're broken down for energy. It's like, okay, we need more energy, so now we're going to be breaking down proteins and fats and convert them to glucose. That's going to send our blood sugar level high, increase our blood sugar level, and one of the problems with steroids, and you probably know this, is it suppresses the immune system. You give steroids, potent steroids, to people that have had any kind of um, organ transplant. They had kidney transplant, liver transplant, lung or heart transplant. You're going to give them heavy-duty steroids to suppress their immune system so the immune system won't reject that transplant organ. So these are good responses to stress and we, we need them, but um, if they go too far and we're getting a release of too much of these corticosteroids, that can be, become a problem. And that problem is called Cushing syndrome. You will see this. You will be talking about it in nursing or medical school. Cushing syndrome due to excess cortisol. It could be cortisol-like medication too, like prednisone. Prednisone is a steroid. It is a cortisol-like medicine. So if you have people on long-term, high-potent steroids, they are going to develop Cushing syndrome. If it's due to a pituitary adenoma, which basically means um, the adenohypothesis, remember we have the adenohypothesis and the neurohypothesis. This is the adenohypothesis, aka the anterior pituitary gland. If it's caused by a tumor in the anterior pituitary gland and that tumor is secreting too much 
ACTH, if you have a tumor here and it's secreting too much ACTH, that adrenal cortex is going to keep on making those corticosteroids. And this is what you're going to see in patients. And I have pictures of real people so you can actually see what this looks like. They're going to have what they call a moon face. It is this round moon face. They usually have red cheeks. Sometimes they'll have acne. If it's a female, they'll start having facial hair. They can get this um, bump of fat on, on their back of their neck. We call it a buffalo hump on the back of their neck. They can develop osteoporosis. Steroids are not good for bones. In fact, if you ever had a steroid shot for any kind of, say, knee injury, hip injury, and they give you steroid shots, it's an anti-inflammatory. All steroids are anti-inflammatory. They decrease inflammation, but they also can lead to problems with osteoporosis. So most most orthopedic surgeons will not give you more than three steroid shots in one area just because of that side effect of osteoporosis. High blood pressure, obesity, but it's a weird obesity. It's this tr trunk obesity. The arms are usually pretty thin. And you're going to have what they call a abdominal striae. You can get striae, and I'll show you, looks like stretch marks, but they are purple. They are real pronounced. You'll get these striae in the abdomen, in the upper chest, arm area. The arms are usually going to be thinner because you have muscle wasting. Because remember, one of the, the side effects with all these hormones, if they're excreted in too high of a um, volume, if you get hypersecretion, it's going to break down muscle. You're going to be using muscle for energy. So you have muscle wasting. Your skin, be, your skin becomes thin. Poor wound healing. If you're a surgeon and you have a patient that has Cushing syndrome, it's going to be hard to even suture them up without the, the, the skin just not even holding together. It doesn't heal very well. Lots of problems with Cushing syndrome. Now, why is it called Cushing's? <laughs> there is this neurosurgeon named Dr. Harvey Cushing. He is amazing. I, I just, I love reading. When I was in medical school, I loved reading about him. He was a pioneer neurosurgeon. He's basically a brain surgeon. And he is the one that discovered this pituitary problem that was causing a hypersecretion of um, ACTH. So he, that's why they named it Cushing syndrome. He discovered it. He studied pat his patients' brains. He has the largest collection of brains of anybody. And they're all stored at Yale where he practiced. He would make these meticulous drawings um, before he'd go into surgery. He was just an amazing neurosurgeon. These are just some of his thousands of jars of brains that he collected over the years. So that's why it's called Cushing syndrome because he, he basically figured out what was going on. So this is what you're going to actually see in real people and not drawings. You're going to have this moon face, a rounded moon face. The cheeks are usually going to be a little bit red. You're going to have this striae, which is basically like stretch marks. Here you see real pronounced in the upper arm and upper chest. And here it is in the abdomen. Here it is in a child, that same moon face. This child has Cushing's 
moon face, red cheeks. It has that bump on the back of the, the neck here, the, the buffalo's hump. That central collection of, of adipose right here, in, especially in that abdomen. The arms are, are usually pretty normal. Here is a classic picture that you're, you see in most textbooks. It's kind of old, um, but I'll just show it to you. This is a patient normal, normal before she had Cushing's. Here it is once she had Cushing's. This is a typical buffalo hump, which is a fat pad back in here. And you can see her face starting to develop that moon faces. Some more pictures, normal, and this is with Cushing's. These are identical twins. Well, I don't know if they're identical twins, but they're twins. Normal Cushing syndrome twin. This is a patient before Cushing's, and this was after she was diagnosed with Cushing's. And this is, this, this patient, this was her normal before Cushing's. This was her a year later. So don't ever think these people just need to stop eating. This is a dramatic change and they cannot do anything to, to change it. Here she is before Cushing's. Here it, she is a year later. Moon faces. She's got the striae, the abdominal fat. And these, <laughs> you'll see lots of these patients that are posting their ordeals of being diagnosed with Cushing's. Moon face, acne, because of the steroids, steroids can give you acne. And then here she is after treatment. Same thing, before Cushing's, after Cush Cushing's. Very dramatic change. This is, this is actually um, Cushing's, and this is after she was treated with Cushing's. So you can see these are dramatic changes, and these changes, they can come on in, in just a few months. Or sometimes they can come on slower, but it's pretty dramatic when they hit. Same thing with this young lady. She was actually going in for surgery, so this was her surgery picture. Classic Cushing's um, moon face, red skin, she's got acne, she does have a buffalo hump on the back too, and this is her now after her treatment. Can hit men too. Here's this gentleman, 2008, and you can see the slow progression till they finally diagnosed him eight years later that he has Cushing's. A lot of people just think, oh, he's just getting fat, when actually it's not because he's overeating, it's because of these corticosteroids that are totally messing up his, um, his fat distribution and so many other parts of his body. Now, Possible causes of Cushing syndrome. When, when we're talking about Cushing syndrome, we're just saying they have all these manifestations of excess corticosteroids. So, is there an or overproduction of cortisol? If it's a pituitary tumor, and we're talking in the anterior pituitary gland, that is, quote, Cushing's disease. That is 70% of all cases, when they say endogenous, it's coming from within the body. 70% of endogenous cases are coming from that pituitary tumor. Not so much an adrenal tumor, mostly the pituitary tumor. Too much ACTH stimulating the adrenal cortex. Exogenous means it's coming from outside of the body. These people are taking steroids, heavy duty steroids. And they may need those heavy duty steroids for a medical condition. 
how do they treat this? If it's a, a pituitary tumor, they are going to surgically go in and try to remove that part of the pituitary gland that is secreting that ACTH. How they do that, I how they know which part, I have no idea. They know it's in the anterior pituitary gland, but they are actually going to go in through the nose, and I will show you another picture. But they're going to go through the nose, through the nasal cavity. Here is the sphenoid sinus. Here is the cella tersica. And remember, here is the pituitary gland sitting in that cella tersica. So they are going to go through the nose. They are going to go through this bone of the sphenoid sinus, go through the cella tersica, the bone here, to get to the pituitary gland. This is a real cadaver, a real cadaver. This is a cadaver. Same thing, here's the nose, here is the nasal cavity, superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha. Here is the entrance to the eustachian tube, as you can see here. Here is the sphenoid sinus. Look at that pituitary gland. Ooh. Here's the cella tersica. This is the pituitary gland. So tiny, so tiny. And you remember what this is? This has been cut. This is cranial nerve number two. Remember the optic nerves cross right over the cella tersica? So one of the early signs that you're going to have with a pituitary tumor is it's going to cause it's got to grow up it can't grow down because of the bone of the cell tersica it's going to be pushing on the optic nerves so you're going to have visual changes i just want to show you this other beautiful dissection here so you can actually see here's the the sphenoid sinus here is the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. Here's the pituitary gland. And here's its connection to the hypothalamus. Amazing, amazing. So this is what they're going to be doing. They are going to go in through the nose, go in in through the nasal cavity, pierce through that sphenoid sinus, the bone there, pierce through the cella tersica to get to the pituitary tumor. Here's the posterior pituitary gland. Here's the anterior pituitary gland. So amazing that they can do this kind of surgery. Now, a lot of people just look at, at, at these these um, individuals and they they'll just go oh she's just she or he is just fat don't especially if you start being aware of the effects of these corticosteroids always keep that in the back of the mind could this be Cushing's one way to differentiate just plain old obesity from Cushing's is Cushing's they're going to have protein wasting. The, the, the muscles are being broken down. They're going to have thin skin, easy bruising, and they're going to have muscle weakness, proximal weakness, mus because of muscle wasting. And the, their upper arms just won't look like a typical fat person, or obese person. So hopefully you understand Cushing's a little bit more, and um, an overproduction of the corticosteroids. We need them. We would die without them, but in too high of a level, an overproduction of them, not good, not good. So where are we? Okay, we've done the pure endocrine glands, pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal gland, and now our last pure endocrine gland that you already know about is the pineal gland. 
We learn that with the nervous system. Here is our diencephalon. Here is the hypothalamus, basically in charge of the pituitary gland. Here is the epithalamus. This is the epithalamus and the pineal gland is part of the epithalamus. So here's our little pine cone shaped pineal gland. It's a pure endocrine gland. What it does is it re releases the horm hormone melatonin. And we discussed melatonin regulates our biological clock, our sleep wake cycle. That's why some people will take melatonin if they have problems sleeping, chronic insomnia. Another IN hormone, so we know this is a protein based hormone. So, next we're just going to look at organs that contain endocrine cells. These are obviously not pure endocrine glands because they have other functions other than just making hormones. First one up is the pancreas. And we've already looked at the pancreas when we did the digestive system. We said the pancreas is both an exocrine and an endocrine gland. Exocrine function is making the pancreatic um, digestive enzymes. They're made by the acinar cells of the pancreas. They are secreted into a duct that's going into the duodenum. So that is the exocrine part. And then we have the endocrine part that was located in the islets of Langerhans that are throughout the pancreas also. So these islets of Langerhans, the endocrine portion of the pancreas, are making two hormones. So this should just be a review for you. Glucagon. Glucagon, when, when blood sugar level is too low, this it's a protein hormone is going to be released and it will signal the liver to release glucose from its glycogen stores. Remember, the liver is storing glycogen. Glycogen is going to be broken down and glucose will be released. That is when our blood sugar is too low. When your blood sugar levels are getting too high, insulin, another protein hormone, will be released. This is going to signal most of the cells of your body. Most of the cells of our body have receptors for insulin. That's going to signal the, the cells of the body to take in glucose from the blood. It also promotes the liver to store glucose as glycogen. So insulin released when blood sugar levels are high glucagon released when blood sugar levels are low, we need to keep our blood sugar range, our blood sugar level in that 70 to 100 level. If you have hypoglycemia, that means your blood, um, you have low blood sugar, and that's going to give you problems if you have hypoglycemia. Low blood sugar is not good. Hyperglycemia High blood sugar level, not good either. We need to keep our blood sugar level in a pretty tight range. So here's your pancreas histology. You should already know all this. You've seen it before. These, these dark cells are the acinar cells. They're part of the pancreas exocrine portion of the, the gland. These lighter pink areas. These are the islets of Langerhans. These are where we have our glucagon and insulin formed and made. This is going to be something you don't know. Here's a diagram of, the, of an isolated pancreatic islet. So we're just isolating one of these and they're showing you that there are alpha cells and beta cells that make up the islets. These alpha cells are making 
the hormone glucagon. That you need to know. I'm not sure why, but they always seem to ask which cells of the islets make glucagon, what cells of the islets make insulin. Not only me, but in a TEAS exam and definitely in nursing, you need to know this. So beta cells make insulin. Alpha cells make glucagon. This, <laughs> I just wanted to bring this in too because this is so important um, for healthcare people going, why, why do diabetics normally, they'll, they're going to have problems with frequent urination. They are peeing a lot. And we're just, we're not talking about little, little volumes of pee. We're talking about huge volumes of urination, lots of water. They're going to be peeing out lots of water. They call that polyuria. Lots of urine is going to be formed. And that is because the kidney is overwhelmed with all this glucose in the blood. Here's a nice kidney. Um, it's taking in the glucose, it's going through the, the tubules, and the kidney is going to be reabsorbing most of the glucose back into the blood. Glucose goes in, glucose comes out. But with diabetes, when you have too much glucose coming in, the kidney is overwhelmed. It cannot reabsorb all that glucose. Going, I can't handle it, guys. You're going to kill me. The glucose stays in the filtrate. It can't be reabsorbed. They call that glucosuria, sugar in the urine, and you're going to get what they call osmotic diuresis. All the sugar glucose that is in the filtrate is going to be holding on to water and you're going to pee lots of sugar lots of glucose and lots of water going to the bathroom all the time and you're thirsty all the time polydipsia you're drinking lots of water polydipsia just means you're drinking lots of water you're always thirsty because you're getting dehydrated because you're peeing so much you're peeing all this free water now you're getting thirsty you'll start losing weight. Whoa, why would you lose weight? Because your poor, your poor cells are going, I can't utilize this sugar. And it's going to say, well, if I can't, if I can't utilize sugar, let's break down um, fat. I need, maybe fat can supply me with some energy. Let's break down protein. And you're hungry because it feels, <laughs> you are hungry. Your cells are basically starving. They can't get that sugar that's in the blood, so you feel hungry. There is lots of problems that's going to go on with diabetes. So next on our list of organs that contain endocrine cells is the hypothalamus. We've already looked at the hypothalamus. Remember the posterior pituitary gland, the neurohypothesis? You must remember, it is the hypothalamus that is making the hormones oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. It's going to send it down into the posterior pituitary gland, but it is the hypothalamus that is actually making these hormones. The hypothalamus has other jobs too. It has got a lot of jobs it has to handle in the brain. The next one is going to be the gonads. We talked about the gonads a little bit in the repro um, system. The gonads are going to be the male testes and the female ovaries. The male testes is going to secrete steroid, steroid sex hormones called androgens. The primary one is going to be testosterone. These are made by the testes. The function is going to be maintaining male reproductive organs and secondary sex characteristics of males like the low voice, the hair, you know, 
their, their muscle mass. And we need testosterone to help in the formation of making sperm. So that's the male gonad, testes, and now the female gonad, ovaries. It also secretes androgen, but that androgen is going to be quickly converted to estrogen. And it's going to be converted to estrogen by the ovar ovarian follicle cells. And these ovari ovarian follicle cells also produce that other hormone that we've talked about before, progesterone. The functions of estrogen and progesterone maintain female reproductive organs and the second, secondary sexual characteristics of females. Also, this important hormone, progesterone, is going to signal the uterus to prepare for pregnancy. Going to be, be building up that uterine lining for pregnancy. So those are the gonads and the hormones they make. Always remember, these sex hormones are all steroid hormones. Getting down to the end here, now it's gastrin. You already know about gastrin too. Gastrin is, is a hormone produced in the stomach. Um, it's triggered by the entry of food into the stomach and the stretching of the stomach when food enters it. Gastrin is going to be released into the blood, travel back to the stomach cells where it's going to increase secretion of the parietal cells in the stomach. Remember, parietal cells make hydrochloric acid. It's going to increase secretion of the chief cells in the stomach. Remember, the chief cells make pepsinogen, which is inactive until the hydrochloric acid interacts with pepsinogen to eventually form pepsin. And gastrin is going to stimulate the smooth muscle contractions of the stomach. So gastrin, a hormone produced by the stomach, that should be a review for you. This is also a review for you. The hormone erythropoietin. EPO secreted by the kidney in response to cellular hypoxia. What does that mean? cellular hypoxia, low O2. There is, remember, lots of blood flow to the kidney. The kidney is a pretty bloody organ. That's why it's so red. So it is monitoring the O2 concentration in the blood. If the kidney detects cellular hypoxia, low O2, it is going to release erythropoietin, it's going to travel in the blood. It's going to go to its target organ, which is the red bone marrow. And the red bone marrow, it's going to trigger erythropoiesis. Always look at that, erythropoietin, I-N. This must be a protein hormone. Erythropoietin, triggering erythropoiesis. Erythro means red. Poesis, formation of, formation of red blood cells. So kidney disease. If you have kidney disease and you're on kidney dialysis, um, it's not going to be releasing erythropoietin the way it should. So these individuals are going to be getting EPO injections every three to four months. Why? Why every three to four months? Because these red blood cells that are released last how many days? What's the average lifespan of a red blood cell? Also review, 100 to 120 days. So after about 100 to 120 days, you're going to need another EPO injection to get erythropoiesis starting up again. So I think that's it for this video. So that covers it for the endocrine system. We are now done.